What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. On this episode, I'm going to be giving you guys my reaction to the Seahawks Cowboys Thursday night game. Also, got a couple of college football topics that I have some thoughts on. Dabo Sweeney's massive changes at Clemson, and what an anonymous Pac 12 coach have to say about Colorado's future. Before we begin, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I just finished up my second to last semester of college, so I'm going to have a lot of free time on my hands over the next couple of weeks, and I'm going to be pushing out a lot of content, so you definitely want to make sure that you have post notifications turned on so you don't miss anything. Remember that every episode of the podcast that's uploaded on the channel is available in audio format on all podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. Give us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. Share the pod with your friends, family members, and acquaintances if you enjoy. And let's get into it. So Thursday night football, the Cowboys take down the Seahawks. This is probably the best Thursday night game that I've watched up to this point in the season. It was a lot of offense, no defense. And when you think about the Dallas Cowboys, we pretty much can all agree that they have one of the best defenses in the NFL. They got a really talented secondary with the also really talented front seven. But anytime this defense goes up against an offense that rivals them in talent, they underperform. They didn't play well against the 49ers. They didn't play that great against the Philadelphia Eagles. And this Seahawks offense, they chewed this defense up, spat them out, and walked all over them. Anytime Deron Bland was matched up against DK Metcalf or JSN, he was getting worked. It seemed like Seattle was running whoever offense on Deron Bland. And this is somebody who is having an all-pro season. And some people feel... He deserves to be in the conversation for defensive player of the year. But he got shitted on all game in this matchup outside of that interception that he made late in the third quarter, which was a really great play on him. But outside of that, this was probably the worst performance that Deron Bland has had up to this point in the season. And we just can't single him out because the rest of the secondary, they didn't play good also. There were a lot of pass interference calls. Stephon Gilmore. How the pass interference penalty called on him. Dan Quinn's defense doesn't play their best football when they're going against their best competition on the opposite side of the football. Meanwhile, when you look at the offense, it was a completely different story. Dak Prescott, this dude has played some really good football for the Cowboys over the last couple of months. And if he continues to play the way that he's had the last couple of weeks, In December, when you look at how tough their schedule gets after this game, you got to go up against the Eagles, the Bills, the Dolphins, and the Detroit Lions. If that Prescott can keep up this level of play, there's no reason why he doesn't deserve to be in the MVP discussion. Against Seattle, he went 29-41, 299 passing yards, three touchdowns. This dude was Kind of machine-like in this game. He was really methodical, making fantastic decisions with the football. But this offensive line, though, they were kind of getting a little bit worked up front by Seattle. But outside of that, this was a fantastic performance that we saw out of Dallas offense in this matchup. But this defense, they got to play a lot better anytime they're going up against any of the NFL's best offenses because Seattle's offense has not been that great this season. This is probably the best performance that Seattle has had offensively since when they beat the Detroit Lions in week two. And when you're going up against a struggling offense, you don't expect for your secondary to get destroyed the way that they did by Geno Smith and company. The Seattle Seahawks, they had the chance to win this game, but their final two offensive possessions were absolutely horrendous. And this team finds themselves in the same exact situation that they were in around this time last year. You see, last year they started out really hot. And then during the middle of the season, late November, early December, this team started to get cold. But then they were able to find a way to backdoor their way into the postseason. Same thing is going on this year. They started out, what, 5-2? and two, And then they got smacked by the Baltimore Ravens. And then after that, This team has lost four out of their last five games. And with the Rams and Packers starting to hit their stride, 
there's a really good chance that if Seattle doesn't turn this thing around, they could find themselves missing the playoffs this year. This defense has played pretty good, but in this game, they had no answers for the Cowboys offense. And offensively, you got to feel really encouraged with what you saw out of Geno Smith. Geno Smith, he has definitely regressed this season relative to how he played in 2022 when he said that he didn't write back to the haters. Well, this season, he's been writing back. But this definitely was a really great performance out of Geno. He was really good throwing the football downfield, something that he did really well last season. He was one of the best deep ball throwers in the league. He had DK Metcalf on a couple of big plays downfield. You also had a touchdown that got taken off to JSN right before halftime, but there was a pass interference call on that play. So they ended up scoring anyway. And we talk about Dak Prescott being able to maintain his level of performance. Geno Smith, he's going to need to play this way for the rest of the season for Seattle. Because their next couple of games, it's hard to see them winning too many of them. You got to play the 49ers on the road. Then you got to play Philadelphia. You got to play Tennessee. And although you should beat Tennessee with Mike Vrabel being their head coach, you can never overlook them. Then you got the Steelers and the Cardinals. There's a really good chance that the Seahawks may only win two of those games and they could potentially miss out on the postseason. This is a talented team. And I still don't really understand why this team, who started out so hot, is now 6-6. Six and six. You can blame the coaching staff all you want to, but the way that this offense just completely unraveled the last two possessions really blew me. Because prior to those, this offense was looking completely fucking flawless against one of the most talented defenses in the NFL. Anything that they wanted to do throwing the football, they were able to have success doing. DK Metcalf, I'm glad I'm not in the NFL having to match up against this dude. He's big as hell, has incredible athleticism. I don't know how these cornerbacks have the balls to want to tackle this dude. Well, I guess they got no choice because they're getting paid millions of dollars to cover and tackle him. But it's just like, he was on in this game. And he was terrorizing Deron Bland. And somebody a couple of days ago asked me, where do I rank DK Metcalf amongst the NFL's best receivers? And I got to say, probably around the 15 to 14-ish range. The thing with DK Metcalf is that he's a really good deep threat. And when Seattle was able to get him involved down the field in a deep vertical passing game, he's one of the more talented wide receivers in the league. And we definitely saw that on flu display in this game. JSN also had a couple of nice grabs as well. This offense played really well, but when it mattered the most, they unraveled. And that's been the theme with Seattle this year, right? This is why I'm not that high on Seattle right now as I was prior to the season starting because they don't play well late in games. They didn't play well against Cincinnati late in that game. This is one of these teams that just doesn't know how to win, especially when they're going up against good teams. The only great team that Seattle has beaten this season that has a winning record was the Detroit Lions. And if they were to run it back with Detroit right now, I don't think there's any way Anybody will pick against Detroit winning that matchup. Even if they do find a way to make it into the playoffs, I don't think they're going to be anything more than an early round exit. And you can't put all of Seattle's woes on Geno Smith. This just has been an inconsistent team. The offensive line played pretty well, but you haven't had this kind of performance out of the offensive line for the last couple of games. This is probably the best this offensive line has played this season. And this is a pretty talented offensive line. Now, I know they've dealt with some injuries and whatnot. But still, for this offensive line to have the kind of performance against the Dallas Cowboys, who have one of the better fronts in the NFL, you're kind of scratching your head wondering, where the hell was this the previous couple of weeks? Especially when you played Cincinnati, you definitely could have used this offensive line when you played the Bengals because that was a big reason why you lost that game. I'm just not really high on Seattle. You know, this was a team that I picked to make it to the Super Bowl before the season. And I know Seahawks fans are going to say, man, JT, you overrated us. Like, we're such a young team. Yeah, you are a young team. But with all the talent you have, 
There's no reason why your season should be unraveling the way that it is. You lost four out of your last five after starting five and two. You were non-competitive against the Baltimore Ravens. There's way too much talent on Seattle's roster for them to be unable to consistently compete with the NFL's best. So these are my thoughts on the Dallas Cowboys and Seattle Seahawks Thursday night matchup. The Cowboys improved to nine and three on the season. And also, I got to state how big this win was for Dallas, because now if the Philadelphia Eagles lose this Sunday to the 49ers, that matchup next week against the Philadelphia Eagles is potentially going to be for who gains control of the number one seed in the NFC. If the Dallas Cowboys hope to make it to the Super Bowl this year, I think they got to make sure that they get that one seed. That one seed is so important because then you got that first round by and you got home field advantage all throughout the playoffs plus you only have to win one game to find yourself in the conference championship game something that the Dallas Cowboys don't really know too much about since VHS came since VHS tapes came out the last time I seen the Dallas Cowboys in a conference championship game I was watching that shit in black and white on my grandma's VCR chain back at her house back in the ville so the Cowboys, if they're going to have any shot at winning the Super Bowl this year, they got to get that one seed. Because if not, they may not be a wild card exit, but I couldn't see them making it any further than the divisional round. But with how well Dak Prescott has played, I feel really confident about their chances of being able to knock off Philadelphia and get control of that one seed if Philadelphia falls to San Francisco. I do think that Dak Prescott is playing the best football that he has played of his career. He looks super confident. He's been a little bit mobile, extending plays, picking up yardage with his legs when nothing is there. I like what I've been seeing out of Dak Prescott, but I'm not ready to announce him as an MVP candidate yet until I see him have the performance that he had against Seattle against Philadelphia and some of the other teams that are considered to be just as good as the Dallas Cowboys. He had a really good performance against Philadelphia in their first go around, but I need to see that again. Okay, I just want to see consistent high-level quarterback play out of Dak Prescott for these next couple of games before I start claiming he's an MVP candidate. Man, are you tired of looking at your stale, boring-ass room? You want to know a way you can spice your room up and turn that thing into an out-of-this-galaxy experience? Click the link in the description or pinned comment and grab you a Starry Projector Light. The Starry Projector Light comes with 10 changeable color options, a built-in Bluetooth speaker, 12 and 15 switchable constellations, planets, moons, and stars. Transform your room from a depressing wasteland into a vibrant starry wonderland. The Starry Projector Light makes for a great holiday gift for family, friends, and loved ones. Click the link in the description or pinned comment and get one today and transform your room into a breathtaking starry wonderland i think that a lot of people are riding off colorado and coach prime way too quickly so i came across a report that said that an anonymous pac-12 coach says that things are going to get dark for colorado in 2024 and i'm just trying to figure out how bad do people really think colorado is going to be next season when this team should be better Dion is going to go into the transfer portal and prove the offensive line and the defensive line. And with Shadur Sanders coming back, we know the talent that Colorado has at wide receiver. Skill position isn't the problem. Running back isn't the problem. Cornerback needs some development, but you trust that Dion Sanders coaching with him being a NFL Hall of Famer, that most of those cornerbacks should improve also. And going into the Big 12 Conference, it's nowhere compared to how tough the Pac-12 was for the Buffs in year one under Deion Sanders. You got to remember that this is the best that the Pac-12 has been in a really long time. The Big 12 is the completely opposite. Just like Colorado, there are a good amount of teams in the Big 12 Conference or the Big 12 Conference, excuse me, that are in rebuild mode themselves. Baylor, Cincinnati, UCF. Kansas is going to be losing a lot of veteran experience. And we saw what happened when Colorado played TCU week one. TCU was a team that was trying to reload. And they had a down year. This is a conference that Colorado should at least be able to win six games in. 
especially when you look at their first three games, they're all very winnable. You got to play North Dakota State, Nebraska, your rival Colorado State. Colorado should be able to get out to a fast start in 2024, similar to how they did this season. You see, with the Pac-12 being as deep as what it was, there was no chance in hell that Colorado was going to be able to skate by with how bad their offensive line was. And as long as they can get average offensive line play in 2024, there's a great chance that they should be bowl eligible and at least be able to win six or more games. Shadur Sanders is one of the best quarterbacks in college football. Anytime you have a quarterback on the level of Shadur Sanders, there's not a single game that you don't have a chance at winning as long as you can block for him. Now, there are people that are going to push back and say, man, you can't put it all on the offensive line. Shadur Sanders holds the ball too long and da-da-da-da-da. Okay, he may hold the ball a little bit too long at times, but it's only because he's trying to make a play. You take Shadur Sanders off this Colorado team and they go winless this past season. He was the heart and soul that kept this team together. And with how great of a leader he is, because you can't deny the dude's leadership, anytime the game was on the line, Colorado had to lean on Shadur to pull them through. He came through more times than not. This is the kind of quarterback that players in the transfer portal should want to play with. Because with them, you're going to have an opportunity to get a lot of attention on you. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to make plays for a damn good quarterback. And like I said earlier, the only thing really holding back this program from getting to the place that they want to get is their lack of talent up front. Now, even though they're going to be bringing in some more guys via the transfer portal on the offensive line, the defensive line, it still doesn't mean that this offensive line is going to improve all that much. It's going to come down to the coaching. Are you going to be able to get these guys in, develop some of the guys that you had on this unit last year, plus find some better guys who are capable starters this season? And then are you going to be able to make sure that those guys have good communication? You see, it's hard to build a good offensive line strictly throughout the transfer portal because good offensive lines in college football mostly have vets that have started with each other for multiple games. Colorado's going to have a couple of these guys that started last year, starting next year, and they're going to have to make some big strides and improvement. But it's not like the Big 12 is this juggernaut of a conference where Colorado should struggle as much as what they did this past season. This conference has a lot of teams in a similar situation of Colorado's. Baylor, they were a team that had high expectations coming into 2023 and they didn't deliver. And Deion Sanders winning four games in his first season is still a massive accomplishment. I don't know why people keep trying to make it seem like it's a disappointment that Deion Sanders only won four games and not more. This was a team that only won one game last year. They were one of the worst teams in all of college football. And he came into his first season in quadruple that brought a lot of hype, brought a lot of attention and revenue to this program. There's a lot of reason to be excited about the future of Colorado football. I don't think things are going to get dark. If you didn't have a great quarterback, then I would agree with this statement. But if you watch college football, anytime you have a quarterback that's considered to be the best in the sport, there's not a single game that you pretty much shouldn't be able to win as long as you have the right guys up front to protect them. Look at Bo Nix and Michael Penix. Yes, they're really good, but they have... Some of the best offensive lines in college football blocking for him. Look at Caleb Williams. He was pretty solid this year, but USC lost a good amount of games this year because they didn't have a great defense and their offensive line wasn't good enough to protect Caleb Williams as they needed to be to win at a high level. Deion Sanders is an untraditional coach. He doesn't do things the traditional way. So the way that these coaches view the way Deion Sanders is handling things, I'm not really going to put too much thought into it simply for the fact that with Dion being unconventional these coaches aren't going to agree with his unconventional methods that's what makes Dion Sanders a unicorn that's what makes him so polarizing a lot of people called him out for his approach to rebuilding this team through the transfer portal kicking a lot of guys out and bringing in pretty much everybody but a few starters from last year back 
And basically, majority of this team was from the transfer portal. Now these guys are going to be into their second season with the program. They're going to have a better understanding of what Colorado wants from them, what Deion Sanders wants from them. And I have a homeboy that actually has a relative, a cousin of his that plays on this team. And I'm not going to say what his name is, but I will tell you this. He plays cornerback. And he was really pissed off at Dion for not giving him that much playing time. But at the same time, he doesn't plan on transferring. He plans on staying at Colorado for another year, proving himself to Dion and trying to earn himself a starting spot. You see, there's this sentiment going around that these players in the locker room don't believe in Dion. They're all going to transfer out because Dion Sanders is a snake oil salesman. Like, we need to stop the false narratives. Because most of us truly don't know how these players feel about Dion. And from hearing from my close source within the program that actually plays on this team, he still has 110% belief in Coach Prime. And so do these players. Of course, there's going to be a couple of guys that transfers out. Who cares? You're just making room for Dion Sanders to bring in hopefully some better offensive linemen and better defensive linemen. Dion Sanders wasn't as perfect as a coach as what I thought and what many other people thought as well. There's a lot of things that he needs to improve on. I didn't really like the handling of what he did to Sean Lewis, taking the play calling duties from him and naming Pat Shermer the offensive coordinator because Sean Lewis is one of the best offensive play callers in college football. There's a reason why, despite getting stripped of play calling duties, he still got hired to be the head coach at San Diego State. Their defensive coordinator... I think this defense definitely did take some steps in the right direction the last couple of games of the season. He's also a really good recruiter, but Dion needs to find him a better offensive line coach and a better defensive line coach, plus with some more talented players on those sides of the ball in the portal, plus he has to be a better recruiter. But as far as Colorado being in some more dark days in 2024, I strongly doubt that. Everything that Deion Sanders has done in life, he succeeded at. This is somebody that worked hard at everything that he does. He always puts his best foot forward. And I expect for him to improve as a coach. And I'm not just about to say, oh, I don't believe no more. Just because a couple of coaches keep having these anonymous things to say about Coach Prime. They don't got the balls to say it publicly for a reason. And I'm pretty sure that next season... Colorado is going to be way better than what they were in 2023, especially playing in a weaker conference. Dabo Sweeney is making some huge changes at Clemson. Okay, he fired his offensive line and defensive end coaches. And another thing that he's doing that many Clemson fans have been begging him to do for the last couple of years is finally using the fucking transfer portal. So I read a report from RN3 that Clemson offered an offensive tackle named Alan Heron, who's from a Division II school, who's currently ranked as the fourth best offensive tackle in the transfer portal at this moment. That's a huge, huge step in the right direction for Dabo because that shows that he's now starting to modernize. He's starting to change his philosophy. Because if you remember, in previous years, and previous conversations, talking to Dabo Sweeney about Clemson taking anybody out the transfer portal, he wasn't going for it. But after getting smacked by FSU with Keon Coleman, Jaheim Bell, and Jordan Travis going off, I believe that gave Dabo Sweeney a wake-up call that said that, you know what, just because I'm not going to use the transfer portal isn't going to stop anybody else in this conference from using it. So I need to go ahead and modernize and get with the times. You see, the best coaches in college football are able to adapt. They're able to put their ego aside, even though they may not want to do something, and sacrifice their ego for the betterment of trying to win. And it seems that's the direction that Dabo Sweeney is starting to head. Now, this is just one offer that he's given out. There hasn't been record reports that he's offered anybody else in the transfer portal. But just the fact that he's offering... One of the top offensive tackles in the transfer portal definitely should give you reasons to believe that he's going to be giving out a couple of more offers to a lot more other guys in the portal. You see, the biggest problem with Clemson has been their lack of execution and good performance on the offensive line. The offensive line has plagued them for the last three to four years. And if Clemson's ever going to get back 
to being a national championship contender, that offensive line needs to be way better. And it's not like Clemson doesn't already have a talented roster. You see, they only have a couple of holes. And with the transfer portal now, it allows you to fill the small holes that you need to fill a good football team. And now that Dabo Sweeney is now starting to look like he's trending towards the direction of being a little bit more involved with trying to get guys out of the transfer portal, it should be a huge reason to be optimistic about the future of Clemson football. And these are changes that had to be made. And the fact that Dabo Sweeney is now starting to make these changes, I believe that Clemson, potentially, with who they get out of the transfer portal, they could be right in the mix of making it into the 12-team college football playoffs next year. And also, Dabo Sweeney doesn't have any more time to continue to be stubborn and build the program in the way that he used to be able to build this program years ago without using the transfer portal. I understand why Dabo wants to build his team mostly through recruiting, because when you build your team through recruiting, you have guys that are committed to the program. You got guys that are more willing to put everything on the line versus guys who you get through the transfer portal. Hell, if they don't start, they pretty much tap out on you. And also, these guys that you bring from the transfer portal, they aren't guys that build your culture. The guys who build your culture are the guys that you bring in from recruiting and you develop for two to three years. Those are the guys who build up your culture. Dabo Sweeney already has a great culture in place at Clemson. So him using the transfer portal, all he's going to be doing is bringing in guys and putting them into an already established culture. You see with USC... The problem is that they got a bunch of guys through the transfer portal, but they never were able to establish a great culture with Lincoln Riley as their head coach. And that's why this past season went south for them. Dabo Sweeney doesn't have to worry about having those same issues. When you already have the culture built and you're not relying on guys through the transfer portal to help build up your culture, you just bring guys in and they fall in line with everything else that's going on in the locker room. These changes are really huge for Clemson in terms of them getting back in the national championship picture. And when you think about FSU, they're really the only team from a talent perspective that really can rival Clemson. And now with Clemson utilizing the transfer portal, they should be able to get back to the top of the ACC. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with the Miami Hurricanes. The Miami Hurricanes are the biggest wild card because they always have talent. The coaching just is never good enough to utilize that talent properly. So Clemson next season, if they can get a couple of big recruits out of the transfer portal, I like their chances of being able to make it back to the top of the food chain in the ACC and being able to get into the 12-team college football playoffs. This is already a really good team. You got Kate Klubnick coming back. You got a couple of vets on that defense coming back as well. You bring in and fill those holes that you have at certain positions of weaknesses that have been holding this program back for the last couple of years. You feel really good about your chances of your dabble of getting back to the top of the food chain. And plus, with Garrett Riley being his OC, I'm pretty sure he's also telling them, hey, dabble, like, you hired me to be your OC, and we need more talent. And they just lost a wide receiver to the transfer portal in Bo Allen. So they're going to have to find somebody who can replace him. And why would you just wait? three to four years and try to develop guys who you get via recruiting when you can go in the transfer portal and get an easy fix for that position with a snap of the finger. And plus, they got a really good NIL collective. They got donors that are willing to spend money. May not be the amount of money that the donors at Texas A&M and Texas are willing to throw out, but it's good enough that Clemson should still get back to the level that they used to be when they were competing for national championship with, with Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson. So let me know what you guys think about Dabo Sweeney getting rid of his offensive line and defensive end coaches. And also, do you think that Dabo Sweeney is really about to modernize and update his philosophy and fully take advantage of the transfer portal now? This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel, rate the podcast five stars if you enjoyed. And I will see you guys shortly with another episode.